Alright, check this out. Things are really picking up in the bubble. NMLA attacks on the core systems have created an opportunity for commanders to engage in something called rescue missions. And these kinds of rescue missions are interesting. I think they're engaging in that they're one of the most atmospheric or environmental missions that one can take part in the game. But, in a nutshell, you're basically flying to a station that is on fire and helping to evacuate people from said station. The mission loop is very short. Uh, most of these missions can be completed in under five minutes from takeoff, and depending on your ship's outfitting, you can even complete them faster than that. This means that if you're trying to grind missions, you can accomplish a bunch of them in a very short period of time. Rescue missions are an interesting dynamic in Elite Dangerous because they're not financially lucrative, but they're also one of the most atmospheric mission types in the game that you can engage in. But in effect, you're basically going to a burning station and you're getting people off of it. But the burning station offers a series of environmental hazards that have to be overcome. The first is debris. As soon as you fly through the airlock, there's a bunch of floating stuff you have to avoid that can damage your hull if you run into it. And then there's heat. Since the station's on fire, the landing bay is super hot and will start abusing your ship from the moment that you cross the airlock threshold. And that means that you need to have a ship that is maneuverable or durable. Either one works. And you need to have a ship that runs cold enough that you can make it to the landing pad without having to abuse your heat sink launcher. So, uh, I thought I'd take this opportunity to detail how some of the heat mechanics in Elite Dangerous works, and then I'm going to show you some different rescue ship builds that work really well for these types of station missions. And the main reason that you would want to do these missions actually isn't to make credits or engineering materials, it's to grind rep. And grind it you can. This is one of the most efficient ways to power level your Imperial or Federal reputation so that you can get ships like the Imperial Cutter and the Federal Corvette both of which I highly recommend for different environments and, and applications. They're top tier ships for PvE, although unfortunately the Federal Corvette and the Cutter aren't, aren't favored in PvP, although they are very competent ships. They are a threat wherever they go, and people who like to fly in wings of four of them can really own territory in CZs. Although the, the favorite for direct PvP is still ultimately the Fertilance. This article on the forums is actually a really good one. Uh, it goes over all of the game's heat mechanics in detail. They reflect heat as a BTU, even though that's not strictly accurate. They just, uh, just call it heat units in your head if it works better. But each ship has a baked-in thermal capacity that's intrinsic. It's like hole hardness. You can't change it. There's nothing you can really do to address it. All you can do is reduce the amount of heat that's getting dumped into the hole by the different modules that you have. But for each megawatt of power that the modules consume, some number of BTUs are generated per second based on the heat efficiency stat of the power plant. This is why low emissions power plants have the largest impact on how your ship works. Uh, for grade E power plants being the worst, the heat efficiency is 1. So 1 BTU is generated per second per megawatt consumed by modules. For grade A power plants, the heat efficiency is 0.4. If we go over into Coriolis, you can see that you can get that even lower. This 5A power plant running the low emissions grade 5 blueprint with thermal spread that also further lowers the uh, heat output takes the amount of power per megawatt that your power plant is producing and times it by this efficiency multiplier. So what you end up with is a ridiculously low amount of heat production based on the megawatts of power being consumed. So if you want to lower your ship's thermal footprint, turning off modules has a huge impact on that because you're directly attacking this figure down here. So switching back to uh, heat mechanics here, different ships have different capacities. So as we scroll down this list, the heat capacity increases, and the ship becomes more tolerant to absorbing large amounts of power. And then we, until we arrive at the Type 10, the Diamondback Scout, and the Diamondback Explorer, the three most ridiculous ships in the game for total heat capacity. These things can have a ton of power consumed and a ton of energy expended, and they never come close to overheating. I mean, hell, the Type 10 can eat an 8B shield cell bank and overheat to maybe 120% without using a single heat sink. Where something like the Viper, which, uh, sorry, the Vulture, can barely take a, a size 5B shield cell bank before it starts to have issues and overheats to over 150%. A smaller shield cell bank 
has a higher impact on this ship because it has a lower heat capacity and likely a power plant that's running hotter as a base value. So heat control is logically tied to power management. This is why combat ships tend to run so hot and why almost everybody who does combat seriously uses an armored reactor because if you go in, I'll show you right here, the uh, armored blueprint applies an efficiency gain. It's not as dramatic as low emissions, where low emissions basically gives you a 65% increase in efficiency. Uh, the efficiency gain that you get from armored is like 12%. But you also get more power generation while you're doing it, and that means the combination of the two come together to create a really favorable environment. I would almost call it overpowered, that it, there's like no reason to apply our, any other blueprint except maybe overcharge to a combat ship, although no one that I know in PvP uh, is applying overcharged very much because you can get most of what you need from armored. There are a couple of shield tanks that can benefit from overcharged, but you'll note here that you get a huge loss in efficiency, which means that your ship ends up running hotter as a consequence of the overcharging. Uh, so especially when you're running plasmas and railguns, it actually works out better most of the time to just armor your reactor and then use power management, turning off different modules like the frameshift drive and the cargo hatch that you know you aren't going to need when you're actively fighting. Anyway, going back to heat mechanics. If you want to go through and read this, it's a, it's a long article. There's some math in here that you can dig into if you want to do some calculations yourself. But this is one of the principal sources that you can go to to understand exactly how heat works on different ships. And this can actually help you establish what combat ship you would prefer. Uh, but the Diamondback Scout and the Diamondback Explorer are profoundly intense in their heat management. They run super cold. With the right setup, you can get frost to condense on your cockpit glass without using heat sinks and have it stay there. Uh, for that matter, you can actually do that with the Anaconda, too, if you do a really aggressive uh, exploration build, but well, that's neither here nor there. Uh, this is part of the reason why the Diamondback Explorer is a popular exploration ship, despite being a small ship. Uh, with the right power management and the right module configurations, this thing just won't overheat. It can park right next to stars and get in some really ridiculous environments, and it takes it like a champ. Even though it scoops so slowly, it's not really that much of an issue with low emissions because it just it just chills. So the low emissions blueprint is actually available to all commanders who've traveled at least 300 light years from the bubble via Felicity Farseer. She only offers a grade one blueprint, but if that's all you've got, stick it on any rescue ships you want to build. You'll definitely need it. Uh, the other big one you want to go for is, where'd she go? Heritani. She's just really far away from the core systems, and it can be a little bit of a chore to go out to, to actually get a grade 5 low emissions power plant. But I think she's the only source in the bubble that offers one. And actually, we can move on to the major builds. I've put together three builds here. I'm just going to go over them really quick. The one that I recommend for players who want to get started with rescue ships is a Type 7 transporter. This is because despite its smaller overall cargo capacity, it's an excellent combination of maneuverability and cost. The Type 7, for some weird reason, has the highest yaw speed in the game, and that can be really helpful when you're approaching landing pads or flying around rescue ships, since it, it helps you get in position a little bit quicker. It does, however, come at a cost. The hull is made of tissue paper, and the boost speed is, well, it's a cargo ship. It leaves a lot to be desired. But you can go in there and play with that using dirty drives if you feel like throwing a lot of engineering materials at these things. And that would actually improve your travel efficiency in normal space getting to the different docking pads. It should be noted that Stations on Fire do not offer docking computer support. All docking operations are full manual. So, uh, the size 1 bracket I've left empty down here because it's really up to you what you want to stick in it. No hard points for obvious reasons, and a single heatsink launcher. Since you're going to be traveling from docking pad to docking pad constantly, it's easy to keep even the small amount of ammo that these things carry fully topped up and just pop one when you enter the station, pick up your passengers, pop one as you leave. You're good and golden as long as you can get out of the station quick enough. And the low emissions blueprint just buys you time before you have to pop. Although even with grade 5, you're going to pop going in and out at least once, most of the time. 
With grade 5, you can sometimes get out of the station before the overheat becomes catastrophic, but in the end, it's, it's kind of 6s. It's your call. The only thing low emissions buys you is a certain level of forgiveness. So it's not essential, but I recommend it for the forgiveness factor. You can just roll up in here with any A-rated power plant you can find, and, and in fact, you can roll up here with no engineering at all, as long as you're paying attention to your heatsink launcher and diligently popping that thing as you see your heat meter rise. Note also that you need to pop before your gear hits the pad, because as soon as it does, you lose the ability to deploy any heat sinks, and there's about a six or seven second window where you're going to be mercilessly overheating while you're docking to the pad until it gets about, I don't know, until it gets down into the bay, and then the station starts absorbing the heat for you, and you don't have to worry about it. But inevitably, as you come back up out of the station, you're going to overheat a little bit again, so you just got to get in the habit of popping the sink when you come back up to the top. So, uh, the Type 7 is, I mentioned earlier, forgiving on cost. This is a 27.6 million credit chip. If you've been playing this game for 10 to 20 hours, you should easily have enough credits to be able to buy one of these. The rebuy is inconsequential. And the main thing that these missions allow you to do is grind rep. So, the faster you can grind, the better. Uh, but if you're a new player, this is your this is your target mark. I don't recommend doing it in mediums or smalls because the time efficiency just isn't there. This is where the game really gets going. But if you've never done these missions and you want to experience the atmosphere of a rescue mission, you know, go ahead and do it in a smaller or medium. No, I'm not going to stop you. No one's going to stop you. But the other thing you, I also recommend is that you do these missions in solo play because the Type 7 transporter is a large ship. There's only one large pad on a rescue ship. There isn't really anywhere uh, for you to go in open play if that pad is busy. Uh, and you can lose credit on these missions if you take too long going back and forth. So it just, for, if, for raw efficiency reasons, it just works better if you are in solo. Or private group if you want, if that suits your fancy. But if you've got more than two people trying to use the same large pad, you're going to end up getting in each other's way. Now, if you're further on in the game, and you haven't completed reputation grinds, the Anaconda gives you 50 more passenger seats. It offers a military slot for all reinforcement packages, and with military-grade composites, you can run this build shieldless and have every single optional internal loaded with economy-class passenger cabins. Core internals are undersized, low-emissions reactor, as mentioned before. Military-grade composite is adequate here. You don't have to go all the way up to reactive, because it just makes the ship's hull more expensive. Um, and you're not you're not trying to do combat, so there's not really any reason to re to cheese your resistances. The heat sink launcher, single heat sink launcher, is plenty. You don't really need more than that. Just pop one coming in and pop another coming out, and then you've got a third in case you make mistakes or get bucked off from the airlock by an explosion inside the station. Uh, 70 power distributor because uh, perm boosting is nice, but it's not strictly speaking necessary. This is a more consequential budget, 350 million. If you've been playing this game for a while, you got 70 to 80 hours, you should probably have enough money to be able to throw at one of these. I haven't. I, I've got billions of credits in my accounts, and I haven't built one of these yet. But I know of a few people who fly these because you do get a higher passenger efficiency, albeit at the cost of normal space transit speed. It's a little bit more of a chore to fly. Uh, now, if you're a veteran player, and you've got deep pockets, and you really want to go nuts on this, the hands-down, overall, best chip for running passenger missions in the game is the Federal Corvette. You get just 10 more seats of passenger capacity compared to the Anaconda, and you'll pay 429 million credits for this thing, compared to the Anaconda's 350 and the Type 7's 27. Taking a step up from the Type 7 is a big ask. And while none of these builds require a prolific amount of engineering, um, they do require a prolific amount of credits, and to be honest, once you're at Federal Corvette, the only reason that I would see to build one of these ships is if you happen to not have Imperial rank done, and you want to go out there and knock it out as quickly as you can. 212 passenger capacity. Uh, the normal space performance is a little bit better. Um, I could probably improve on that with dirty drive tuning, but no, none of these ships are spec for it. Now, let's see. If I slap dirty on there. 
drag drives. You can get it up to 303 on the Federal Corvette and on the Anaconda. Yeah, these two ships are close enough. The Anaconda's got a slightly better boost speed, but we're talking about like single digit meters per second. So uh, take your pick. The Anaconda's more accessible, slightly cheaper, and the difference of 10 passenger seats means, you know, uh, dealer's choice. But if you're new or you're like me and you just don't do this often enough, the Type 7's easy. You can find these hulls all over the galaxy. They're inexpensive. Um, you don't have to work that hard to put these things together. In fact, you could probably slap this Type 7 together in under an hour and fly out to one of these systems that's in trouble and get everything shipped in so that you're good to go. Uh, that's rescue missions and heat mechanics in a nutshell. So I will catch you guys later.